Here we are back in Baltimore, Maryland, a city that needs no introduction. Not because it doesn't matter, but because I covered it in a previous video. In that video, we covered Northwest Baltimore, one of the better parts of town. And as wild as that video was, this one is much, much worse. This is the real, authentic Baltimore. But before we get into it, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. You can also follow the Instagram page as well. So let's get into it. The story begins in Northern California, in the midst of a cultural revolution. In the mid-1960s, the Black Panthers had a new take on how to tackle civil justice. They marched the streets and preached rhetoric that had never been seen before. It was a major movement, and it gained traction throughout the state and even within the system. In the late 1960s, a San Quentin inmate began studying the Black Panther publications. This would be a young man named George Jackson. George was born in Chicago, but moved to the Bay Area in the early 1960s and right after moving, he caught a case that landed him a one-year-to-life sentence. Yes, you heard that correctly, a one-year-to-life sentence for taking $70. Well, after six consecutive years, George began getting anxious. He knew that he was done wrong, and he needed an outlet to explain it. And that's when he discovered the Black Panthers and all of their publications. Now, he was ultra-motivated to make changes from within. The same way the Panthers wanted freedom in society, George wanted freedom within the prison. So in order to do this, he started his own version of the Black Panthers. In 1967, George got together with W.L. Nolan and started the Black Gorilla Family, also known as BGF. Together, they grew BGF throughout the facility and became a force to be reckoned with. By 1969, they had conducted multiple riots, some of which resulting in tragedies. So after a short while, the warden wanted George Jackson and W.L. Nolan gone. He figured that if they left, BGF would no longer be a problem. So in January of 1969, Jackson Jackson and Nolan were transferred to Soledad State Prison, located 150 miles away. This changed nothing for San Quentin, as another BGF leader would step to the plate. On top of this, now Jackson and Nolan had a new population to recruit. Well, long story short, Soledad's BGF population grew to the hundreds, all willing to fight for their freedom. And that's when tragedy hit. On January 13, 1970, a BGF riot broke out at Soledad State Prison. During the riot, a corrections officer ended up claiming the life of W.L. Nolan. The incident devastated George Jackson, and he believed that W.L. was done wrong. However, the officer was never charged, and it was considered justified. So four days later, George Jackson decided to take it into his own hands. On January 17, 1970, George Jackson claimed the life of corrections officer John V. Mills. This was a major incident in the national news, and it instantly gave BGF some notoriety. George Jackson ended up being charged and sentenced to life. And here is where things get crazy. BGF did not want to accept this verdict, and they needed George to be free. So George and his brother Jonathan came up with a plan. The plan was to kidnap an inmate and a judge during their trial. They would then drive away and tell police that they'll only give them up in exchange for George Jackson. Obviously, this is a ridiculous plan but they went through with it anyway. August 7th, 1970. It's a beautiful summer day in Marin County, California, one of the wealthiest and safest counties in the entire country. And on this morning, a man named James McLean appears at Marin County Court. 10 a.m. Jonathan Jackson and two BGF associates arrive at the courthouse. They enter the courthouse with concealed blowers under their jackets. And boom! They burst into the courthouse. They demand for everyone to get down and that the officers give up James McLean and Judge Haley. So the officers stand down while BGF takes the two from the courthouse. They walk them down the hallway and out the front door. And there, over a dozen Marin County sheriffs are waiting for them. This was a major national incident, something that California had never seen before. BGF was showing that they had no respect for authority and that they weren't scared of anything. So because of this, they instantly became the main focus of the FBI. Hundreds of members would be arrested over the next few years and the movement would fizzle out. However, they would remain operating within the system, but they lost their main focus. The activism era of BGF was over by the end of the 1970s.
Well, that was how BGF started and how they got their first notoriety. And after the 1970s, BGF was never heard in the news. However, that would change in the mid-2000s. Let me introduce you to a man named Eric Brown. In the 90s and 2000s, Eric Brown was the biggest hustler in the city of Baltimore. But unlike your typical street dude, this guy was professional as well. He worked professional jobs, dressed nicely, and covered up his dealings very well. In fact, he even had his own charities to fight crime and poverty in the city of Baltimore. By all accounts, he was a stand-up, well respected member of the Baltimore community. Well, Eric was always a huge fan of the original BGF movement. In fact, one of his charities was named after a BGF saying. Well, after a decade of living a double life, Eric was finally arrested in 2006. After pleading guilty, Eric was sent to Maryland State Prison. This was the perfect opportunity for Eric to be the next George Jackson. Eric now had access to over three dozen BGF members. However, he was disappointed with their presence in the facility. It was nothing like how George Jackson wanted. Because he was such a big fan of George, this bothered Eric to the core. So to change this, he called a meeting with all the BGF members. He explained the history of BGF, what they're supposed to stand for, and how members are supposed to act. Some of the members were receptive to Eric, but only because he was well respected in Baltimore. So in order to better convey his message, Eric decided to write a book of rules for BGF members. This became known as the Black Book, a 72-page manual for all BGF members to memorize. The book explained the history of BGF and ultimately what they're fighting for. It also contains a list of rules for BGF members to follow. Now let me clarify, Eric was not a member of BGF when all of this was taking place. Instead, he was a respected OG who had a passion for the organization. Well, this ultimately led him to being the BGF leader in 2007. His goal was to take over the facility and have everything run through him. This wasn't much different than George Jackson, except they had polar opposite strategies. Eric didn't like confrontation because he knew it was bad for business. So instead of fighting the correctional officers, he wanted to work with them. But this is no easy task, and here's how he did it. Eric befriended a BGF member named Tavon Bulldog White. Tavon was wild in the streets of Baltimore, but he was also wild in the sh Whoa. Let me chill out. Simply put, Tavon was a ladies man, the kind of guy who had endless games. So early on, Eric Brown had Tavon sweet talking the female correctional officers. This eventually went too far, but we'll get to that later. Well, the strategy worked and the CEOs began bringing in anything that Eric and Tavon wanted. Eric was known to order lobster and steak dinners with the side of vodka, but this operation was much larger than food and drinks. They turned this into a major business, bringing in items of high demand. Eric and Tavon would buy the items from the COs and then flip them for double to the inmates. Quickly, they began generating over 16000 a month each, all while behind bars. So for months, BGF were living like kings in prison. But then Tavon would take things too far. By 2010, four correctional officers were pregnant with Tavon's babies. Of course, this caused the warden to raise an eyebrow. So that's when he secretly called the FBI to conduct a full investigation. In 2010, the FBI tapped the phones of Eric, Tavon, and all of the female COs. And what they found is absolutely astonishing. They overheard Eric ordering food to his cell, Tavon talking about his newborn babies, and both of them talking about all the money they're making. This was all material to build one of the easiest cases of all time. On August 17, 2010, 2011, Eric Brown, Tavon White, and 11 correctional officers were charged with racketeering. During the case, it was revealed that Tavon was dating 11 correctional officers at the same time. What in the world? Well, this was a major takedown, and the FBI figured that this was the end of BGF in Maryland. But this was actually just the start. As BGF members were released back onto the streets, they began taking over neighborhoods of Baltimore. They gained control of multiple neighborhoods, each known as a regime. And the first regime to make noise was Highland Town, located in East Baltimore. Highland Town BGF was led by two men, Daryl Anderson and Capone Chase. We start off with Mr. Daryl Anderson, one of the most feared people in Baltimore history. He's the kind of guy that you can't even look wrong at. And that takes us to the night of July 7th, 2012. 
It's a hot Saturday night and a group of friends meet up at TB's Lounge in Parkville. Specifically, a man named Philip Gray takes his friend Derek Gamble to the lounge. As they arrive and enter the lounge, right there is Daryl Anderson. Philip is Daryl's cousin, so he introduces him to his friend. The night continues smoothly for a couple of hours. 2 a.m. The lights flip on and the night at the lounge is over. So everyone clears out into the parking lot and that's where things go left. For whatever reason, Daryl Anderson and Derek get into an argument. Philip knows that this is bad news, so he tells Derek to get in his car. So Derek hops in the car and Philip begins driving away. But that's when Daryl makes a wild decision. Daryl hops in his Dodge pickup truck and speeds away. Despite there being numerous witnesses, no one would come forward. And because of this, Daryl's madness would continue. June 27th, 2013. Daryl Anderson is at home in Highland Town when he gets a call. A friend named Tiara Fallen tells him that she needs his help. So instantly, Daryl drives to her house. Tiara tells him that she had a dispute with a group of girls up the street. And that's all Daryl needs to hear. He walks up the block. These are the terrible kind of things that take place in the streets of Baltimore. But thankfully, this time witnesses would come forward with information. And because of this, the next day, police would go looking for Daryl Anderson. They raided his home and all of his relatives, but Daryl was nowhere to be found. That's because he had already driven down Highway 95 on his way to Alabama. After weeks of not finding him, Baltimore police officially made Daryl Anderson public enemy number one. And thankfully, this prompted witnesses to come forward about the incident at TB's bar in 2012. However, Daryl would not be found for quite some time. In the meantime, his right-hand man Capone Chase would follow in his footsteps. In May of 2013, Capone Chase was arrested for assault. However, the district attorney would drop the case after three weeks in custody. Despite the charges being dropped, Chase was still upset about being caught in the first place. He couldn't figure out how he was caught, and he knew that somebody around him was working with police. Well, over the next month, information was released that his friend Ramon Rodriguez Rodriguez was working with police. This made Capone livid, but he calmed himself down and waited to play it cool. For the meantime, Capone acted as if he never knew and that Ramon was his friend. July 13th, 2013. Capone Chase calls up Ramon and tells him to meet him at a local park. An hour later, the two meet up at a park in Greektown. And that's when Capone calmly tells Ramon what he's about to do. Bam. Directly after the incident, Capone Chase would flee Maryland and go on the run. And that's how he became public enemy number two of Maryland. So that means that the two most wanted men in the state were both BGF. And this is how Maryland knew that BGF was a problem. By the start of 2014, Capone Chase and Daryl Anderson were both found. Capone Chase had a quick trial and received 50 years to life. And for Daryl Anderson, he put up a fight, literally. According to court documents, Daryl flipped off the judge on multiple occasions and tried to appeal everything they decided. However, his efforts came up short and he received life as well. Baltimore police figured that they slowed down BGF, but the worst was yet to come. And that takes us to a different part of the city. Welcome to West Baltimore. Abandoned houses, trash, and shot spotter activation on a nightly basis. That's West Baltimore. The area has always been rough, and it breeds even rougher people. Well, BGF's most dangerous regime happens to be in West Baltimore's Franklin Town. They go by YGG, and they're led by a man named Devante Harrison, also known as YGG Tay. Tay was a born hustler, the only guy in the neighborhood who always had the nice cars and money. He started getting money in 2013, and with that, he needed to some protection. This is where his best friend comes into play. His best friend is a man named David Warren, also known as L.A. Michon. This guy was the main enforcer for YGG, the kind of guy who would do anything for Tay. So together, Tay and Michon were the equivalent to Eric Brown and Tavon White. Tay was the money maker and hustler, and Michon was the cold enforcer. Well, in 2014, YGG Tay got into business with some hustlers up the street. Directly across Highway 40, there's another West Baltimore neighborhood 
neighborhood called Edmonton. This is who Tay was doing the majority of his business with early on. After a while, they owed Tay a lot of money and they never paid him back. And that's when Tay decided to send a message. June 29th, 2014. Tay calls up Michonne and tells him that he needs him to handle business. The guys who owe me money are hanging out at their local rec center like they aren't in debt. Michonne needs to hear nothing else and instantly heads that way. 10 p.m. Michonne pulls up to the crowded rec center. There, he spots the men that Tay told him about, but they're with all of their friends. But Michonne doesn't care and he walks into the rec center with no fear. And that's when he makes a wild decision. <laughs> Michonne then meets up with Tay who hands him $10,000. Somehow they would both get away with this. In the meantime, YGG Tay was building a national empire. He began doing business in LA, New York, and even down south in Atlanta. As his money increased, his lifestyle began to change as well. He began traveling to resorts all over the country and flexing a bunch of cash. And of course, he wanted to become a rapper as well, so in 2016, he put out his first song. The music got a lot of views and YGG Tay became a Baltimore star. In 2017, he released hit songs like Fresh Out of Retirement, that got 2.2 million views. Tay's success inspired Michonne to drop music as well. Except his... No. He wasn't on the same level as Tay, but maybe that's because he was too busy in the streets of Baltimore. In 2016, YGG got into a serious rivalry with another side of town. This would be Bel Air Road of East Baltimore. And over the next year and a half, LA Michonne would be relentless. In March of 2017, Michonne was arrested for 11 counts of attempted M. Somehow though, by May 19th, all 11 yeah, charges yeah. were dropped and Michonne was back on the streets. This infuriated the community and most importantly, Baltimore police. They had worked on building this case for over a year just for the district attorney to drop it after two months. Baltimore police warned that this was a bad idea and that Michonne was a danger. His release shocked everyone, even the rivals in West Baltimore. And this this prompted them to accusing Tay and Michonne of being informants. Well, Tay did not appreciate this rumor making its way throughout the city. He knew the rumor could potentially hurt his rap career. So like always, Tay gave Michonne a call. August 4th, 2018. It's a Wednesday night in Baltimore and Michonne is looking for those who started the rumors. He pulls up to the house of those who he believes are responsible. He parks his car and walks up to the house. Boom! He kicks down the door and that's where things go left. Another devastating day in Baltimore, and another case dropped for Michonne. So again, he was back on the streets of Baltimore. Michonne gets another call from Tay. Tay tells him about Bel Air Road members who are being disrespectful. August 7th, 2018. It's a Tuesday morning in Northeast Baltimore and Michonne goes looking for Bel Air Road members. He drives around the area and finds no one outside. So instead, he pulls up to the house of a known rival. No one is outside, but the man's car is in the driveway. So Michonne decides to make a wild decision. Brian was a roofer who was repairing the home in the early morning. No one could figure out this random act and Brian's family was set on getting it solved. Baltimore police could not figure it out so the FBI decided to step in. Within a few months, the FBI tied everything together. They figured out everything that YGG Tay and Michonne had done since 2014. So in 2019, the entire YGG was arrested just like that. All of the members are currently facing life. That was it for YGG and hopefully the rest of BGF can be taken down as well. But in Baltimore, getting that done is probably something that'll never happen. Many have used this case as an example of the dysfunction in Baltimore. The district attorney and police can't get much done, but when the FBI steps in, it's an easy case. Well, that was the story of BGF, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of Swamp Stories. If you did, make sure to leave a like and subscribe if you're new. Also, let me know what you want to see next. Peace!